Yeah, I'm, I'm, since I, I don't think most people here did um, or uh, interested recently in quantum circuits or, or did work on quantum circuits, I'll, I'll do a pretty maybe broad presentation of the topic and only towards the end go to more uh, recent things I've been interested in. Um, so, so this is work I did mainly with uh, two, uh, where is, uh, yeah, so, so mainly with a student in Berkeley, Imu Bao, and a postdoc uh, who is now at MIT um, as a faculty member, uh, Sun Won Choi, and recently uh, another student joined some of this uh, work on, on quantum circuits, uh, Zach Weinstein. So um, maybe one way to uh, make a segue into, into this problem is, is to think about thermalization. And um, first of all, we know that classical systems thermalize, like my cup of coffee, if I pour some milk into it, it will mix uh, and um, will become kind of maximally random. And, and one way to think about classical thermalization oops, is, well, here is a molecular dynamic simulation. You start uh, the system in some initial state and uh, it starts to move chaotically. And because, uh, because chaos is so sensitive to initial conditions after a very, very short time, you're basically finding yourself in a new random state. So classical thermalization is in a sense basically a randomization of, of, the config, of the configuration. The important thing is that in a classical state, if you take a snapshot, all the information is encoded locally into the snapshot. So if you, see, if you have a snapshot that shows you all the positions of the particles and all the velocities of the particles, basically you know the state of the system. Um, and in principle, that basically perfectly defines the state and the initial conditions for the continuing uh, motion. Quantum thermalization is somewhat different. So, uh, and basically a lot of this talk is related to the tension between quantum-like and classical-like thermalization. So in quantum thermalization, you might have a well-defined uh, state where every all the information about the state is defined locally for example, these spins, you see exactly the state of the system by looking at the orientations of all the spin in the initial state. But once you let it evolve in time, the spins start to entangle uh, due to the unitary interactions that coupling between them. And at some point, you can't really draw the state because the information about the wave function is really encoded in highly non-local degrees of freedom. Um, basically, if the system is entangled, it's in encoded in the coefficients of very non-local coefficients associated with the weights of the classical configuration. Uh, and, and the way to, uh, one way to measure this non-locality is to look at the subsystem entanglement entropy, basically the reduced density matrix of subsystem A uh, and take the um, von Neumann entropy of that and you see that it grows as a function of uh, time. Oh, sorry, there is a typo here. It should grow like t, not like log t. Uh, this was this is a typo. It grows like time uh, linearly in time, and and basically that is telling you that uh, you are losing all the local information that was encoded into a. It becomes completely non-local and shared with the entire system. Uh, so. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's basically the essence of quantum thermalization. The state becomes effectively random, but random in the big Hilbert space and not random in, in local degrees of freedom. So yeah, this is uh, kind of the difference between classical thermalization, the state becomes random, but information encoded locally while in quantum, the state becomes random in Hilbert space, all information, in, essentially all the information is encoded non-locally. And now the question is, how is this picture affected by the presence of an observer? So suppose we uh, let the system thermalize quantum mechanically, but we have an observer looking at the system. Now, if the observer could 
was a Maxwell demon or something, and it could collapse the entire state, could look at every degree of freedom in, in your system, then of course it will collapse it immediately to a, a classical like state. But the observer is not that observant. It observes only a fraction of the degrees of freedom. And the question is, so, so some degrees of freedom are disentangled because the observer observes them. And the question is, what is the kind of state you get? Is it quantum? Is it classical? Does it have non-local information or local information? Something in between. Is there a sharp transition between classical and quantum thermalization? Um, if does it depend on time? If this is, if my observation is say initially my system looks quantum mechanical, maybe after I observe it for a sufficiently long time, everything will become classical. So all of these questions are basically the motivating questions to what I want to talk about today. And just to mention that they're well, they could have sounded a pretty esoteric and philosophical questions until maybe a few years ago. Uh, recently, there are experiments that kind of probe exactly those questions. And, and these are uh, you know, the experiments with big quantum circuits, such as, as Google's quantum supremacy experiment. So for example, that experiment, this is the chip. And if you look at the chip, what it has is an array of, of qubits coupled by gates. Uh, that they say are programmable, they can design what they'll be, but we can think of them because they're you know, not particularly optimized to do some specific calculation. You can think of it maybe as random. Uh, and, and you start to evolve the system. And here I show how it evolves from the left to the right, uh, and just show maybe five representative bits, but it's, it's really a whole array. Uh, and, and it, it uh, evolves to the right. At the end, uh, they measure all the um, output qubits in some computation and basis, zero or one, and repeat many, many times, get some distribution. And then they do a statistical test on that distribution, compare it to um, simulation. And by, um, by the statistical test, they can basically test how much non-local information there is. So maybe to be a bit more precise, what they do is uh, they, this machine you can think of is a, it's a machine that uh, spits out random strings, right? Because every time you do the experiment, you'll get a different uh, measurement result. And you can ask whether that uh, random string generator generates strings in a completely uniform distribution which would be easy to simulate classically. I mean, everyone knows how to, well, even that is maybe not so easy, mm -hmm. but, but it, if, it, if it is generated by, quantum, uh, by a quantum system like that, it turns out the distribution is very far from being, it's not, it's, it has some very important differences, I would say, from being uh, exactly uniform. In fact, it's like a speckle pattern in a two to the n dim dimensional Hilbert space in a speckle pattern of a laser because of interference effect. Some strings will be much more, um, much more probable than other strings. And that's exactly what they're looking for. And the, that statistical test showing that it's basically above uh, zero means that they have this kind of non-locality, that the state has passed through a big Hilbert space and not has not been local. So basically, my bottom line here is that these, there are experiments that are probing this kind of non-locality. You can start to ask, can we change this by adding measurements, for example, and how, yeah, how this would be affected by, by measurements? Um, so here there is an important result. Uh, I'm talking now about monitored systems, systems that are observed by an external observer. And a lot of you have heard about open systems. And you can say, well, and sometimes it is said kind of offhandedly that, uh, that an open system and a monitored system, um, that if you couple your system to decoherence to, to a bath, then the bath is sort of measuring your system and, and then it's essentially the same thing. So I want to emphasize here that it is actually not the same thing. So uh, a system coupled to a bath, which describes usual uh, decoherence processes, gets entangled with the environment. So the time evolution that you have to describe if you have this kind of coupling to a bath or decoherence 
is, is a time evolution that takes pure states to mixed states and eventually basically you have to evolve that mixed state. In, for example, if the bat has certain properties, Markovian or so, for example, it would be described by a Lindblad equation. If it's discrete, it would be like a Krauss map. Things that I, I think are well known to um, already and, and we're used to. Monitored systems are different because if I have a pure initial state, I measure it and it evolves according to the measurement um, postulate of quantum mechanics. It's projected to one of the measurement outcomes. Uh, and the time evolution is basically an ensemble of pure state trajectories, right? So if the, and each trajectory is defined by the sequence of measurement outcomes that came out in this uh, trajectory. Uh, now you'd say, okay, but really is there a difference? Because if I look at the average of all this, this is basically the same as, as the uh, evolution with, you know, in, in the bat. And in, in, in indeed, in order for this to be different, the observer has to somehow make use of the information they gain from measurement, either by conditioning some observable on the results of the measurement or by doing for feed forward um, feedback on the system. So if they don't do that and you discard, just discard the measurement results without doing anything with them, without conditioning on them or anything, then indeed it comes back to being just a, a usual open system. And most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be a strictly only in the monitoring system. And towards the end, I want to ask, okay, what happens if we actually do add also the coherence to that, to, to this effect? But, but I'm, I'll mainly look at the monitored system. I, I think it's actually kind of interesting. A monitored system really highlights the fact that um, an observer has a special role in quantum mechanics. And, and the way we analyze these monitored systems tells you exactly what it means to be an observer. Because I think I remember from, you know, when I studied quantum mechanics first, people said, oh, does it require consciousness? What does it mean, and observation and all that? And I think here now that we can, really analyze it in terms of information theory, we understand that really in order to be an observer, what you need to do is have at least some kind of processing power. You don't have to have consciousness or anything. If you have processing power that allows you to condition on a certain, so you have memory that tells you, okay, this is the result I got now. Let's condition on it, wait for the same result to occur again and uh, ask some, so, uh, some question about it or process and according to the processing of the information you gain, you feedback, then you're an observer. If you can't do that, then you're an environment. So in, in a sense, an observer is an environment with, a proce with processing power and memory. Uh, so, so does it mean that like uh, if I add a, a classical gate somewhere, this is an observer? Yes, and if you program it to do something, that then you can think of it, yes. So if you couple your system, if, if your system is coupled to a detector, it's an experimental system, and this detector is basically some set of classical gates that are programmed to do something like condition, then they behave as an observer. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They need to feedback somehow, either mm -hmm in the same process or after you do it many times. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so a useful theoretical model uh, to, to understand these systems is that people have been using for now, for, for, for a few years now, is a random circuit with, which consists of random unitary gates. It's called now hybrid quantum circuit. Hybrid because it has two types of elements. One element is a random unitary gate so uh, these gates are uh, random unitary gates. And um, in addition, you uh, kind of sprinkle measurements in between. There is some probability for every output uh, qubit that it will be measured. And if it's measured, then you uh, just do the usual measurement, uh, postulate born uh, measurements in quantum mechanics, which is to project onto one of the measurements comes with probability that depends on the state. Basically, you want it's the expectation value of the projector on that uh, eigenstate, uh, eigenvalue of the measurement uh, operator uh, in, in the state, in the many body state. Um, so this state, this system has 
different sources of randomness. First of all, the model itself is random because uh, the positions of the measurements are random. The um, unitaries are random, but these are kind of not essential sources of randomness. They could be, you could decide to quench them in a particular set of experiments. Uh, there is also a fundamental source of randomness, which is just the measurement outcomes. There is no escape from that. It's part of quantum mechanics. But the randomness in the other things will help us theoretically. And, and as I mentioned, if you start with a pure state, that state will remain pure all the time. And then um, we want oops, to uh, have a measure of the non-local um, correlations in the system. And as I mentioned, um, uh, a good measure is the subsystem entanglement entropy. So if we take subsystem A, uh, we measure on a particular trajectory, so a particular set of measurement outcomes, M1, M1 to ML, uh, we, we, for a particular set of measurement outcomes, we want to ask what is the entanglement entropy. And then we can, after calculating the entanglement entropy, we would maybe average over all the possible measurement outcomes. But this would be an example of, um, uh, it will tell us how a typical trajectory uh, behaves, whether a typical trajectory has a uh, large entanglement or small entanglement. Uh, and this was done in you know, about three, two, three years ago by, by um, Adam Nahuman collaborators and, and Matthew Fisher and uh, Yao Dong Li. Uh, oops. Let's see, this is, is not there. Okay. Yeah, and, and what, what they found numerically was very nice that actually, if you have, if the measurements are um, infrequent, uh, rare measurements will uh, basically not interrupt the growth of entanglement. It will still grow linearly in time up to, and then saturate on uh, uh, entanglement proportional to the volume work length in this case for one dimensional qubit array, length of the subsystem. So that's called volume of entanglement. It means that there is a lot of non-local information, but uh, beyond a critical uh, value of the measurement rate, you, uh, the system will collapse. Basically the measurements will entangle, will disentangle enough to uh, bring it to uh, area law entanglement. So, so there is a critical point where uh, the volume of entanglement uh, goes to zero. So the entanglement density goes to zero at some critical point. So this was a very, very nice uh, result from numerics. There were some uh, theoretical um, uh, approximate theoretical arguments that showed that this transition should occur. But there was also some uh, there was also some controversy, or I would say some some puzzle, because uh, there was another paper by Amos Chan et al. that argued that actually there can there can never really be a, a steady state, even in an infinite system, where uh, you have um, a volume of entanglement. And the idea is that, um, well, if we try to write a rate equation for how entanglement is changing as a function of time, let's look at every time step. So at every time step entanglement, if, if we think that it's a competition between um, unitary gates that entangle the system and measurements that disentangle because every measurement takes uh, a qubit and makes it disentangled from all the rest. So we can ask how much the entanglement changes in a single time step. And in a single time step across this cut, there is one unitary. So the most the entanglement can grow is by log two if, if there are qubits. But on the other hand, there are uh, everywhere in this um, system, there are n times p, here p is the probability of measurement per gate, uh, uh, n times p measurements. So you disentangle n times p qubit. So your entanglement entropy can go down by an extensive amount. So it's a no contest between like order one increase and order n decrease, and you will get basically a steady state, which is always non-entangled. So how can that, you no, know, how can you reconcile this argument with the fact that there is a, a stable volume law phase here? Now, I, I want to 
point out that the stable volume of phase is only in the thermodynamic case. If you're in an uh, infinite system, if I had a finite system, what you find is that you have this kind of steady state that is quasi steady state that has um, volume or entanglement. But after a time scale of order exponentially long with the system size, you do this entangle everything. But this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really a say an infinite system, it still should disentangle according to this argument, and it doesn't. And the uh, reason why it doesn't turns out to be interesting, the reason why uh, this argument is wrong has to do with uh, pro natural protection uh, of quantum information due to scrambling. So, so this is something we pointed out in, in this paper uh, with, with uh, Sunon Choi and, and Yimu. Um, the, uh, the idea is that uh, the real competition here is not a competition between entangling unitaries and disentangling uh, uh, dis disentangling by, by measurements. It's, it's really the fact that the, the, what the unitaries do is they scramble the quantum information, make it non-local. If they manage to scramble the information enough by the time you measure, you do local measurements, then the local measurements might disentangle a particular qubit, but they don't change the entanglement between the two sides of the system because the information about the entanglement, the quantum information about the you know, relation, correlations between the two sides of the system have been encoded by the unitaries into highly non-local degrees of freedom that cannot be revealed by measuring locally. So actually what we showed is that Although in principle, a measurement, measurements can disentangle uh, uh, an extensive number of qubits at every time step, they in fact can, they don't have to. And if the information is sufficiently scrambled, it turns out they only disentangle order of one over Hilbert space dimension uh, of a qubit, so nothing basically. So they can entangle something or nothing depending on how scrambled the system is. And that's the essence of the phase transition. So in some sense, um, you can think of the volume law phase as a phase where you are able to encode information in non-local degrees of freedom and thereby protect a fraction at least of the qubits from uh, being uh, revealed by measurement. So it's an emergent error correcting code, natural error correcting code that is uh, affected by the scrambling of the unitaries. Um, and and the, uh, the transition is then an encoding transition in which the capacity of the channel to transmit coherent quantum information is, is vanishing at a critical point. Okay, so what I would eventually, one thing if I'll have time to and hope to talk about uh, is, is the what happens if in a more real circuit where we also have, in addition to measurements, we can have some decoherence. Um, so, so that's something that is not answered by, 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 this, uh, by this and, and I want to address. Uh, so, so in order to address this, and I'll address one more thing. So, but the first thing I want to uh, um, talk about is a more basic thing. How, how do we actually um, theoretically uh, describe this transition and the phases, measurement and measurement induced phases? It seems like a very complicated non-equilibrium, quantum non-equilibrium process. And the nice thing is that because we're dealing with random circuits, um, and as long as we want to look at some universal aspects of this physics, it can be um, it can be done very nicely by mapping this information dynamics to equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, models. So so that's what I want to show you, and it I, I think gives actually very nice intuition to a lot of the effects. And that intuition will allow us to predict to kind of surpri otherwise surprising effects. Uh, one of them has to do with measurements uh, in in sorry, measurement induced phases when there is this decoherence. And another is um, a finite time uh, transition. So let's see if I can uh, get there. Yes, we go on to yeah, sure. Task, sure. Uh, could you actually ever use this intense volume loss scrambling as an actual error correcting code? Um, 
That's a very good question. Not clear and probably not easy because uh, it's an error correcting code without a decoding scheme. So if you had a decoding scheme, it would be nice because the nice thing about this error correcting code is it has a finite um, code um, code rate. Right? So, so there right. is, you don't need an infinite number of uh, physical qubits to encode a logical qubit, unlike, a qubit, yeah, unlike uh, for example, surface code right. and all that. So it's, it's much better code in some sense, but the problem it's hard to decode and right. we don't know of a way to decode it. But maybe it can give ideas to something more structured and less random that does have efficient decoding and has some finite has a finite uh, decoding rate. So there were some attempts in that direction that were not really successful. Uh, one by, but, but they're in the right direction, I think. So by Michael Gunnens and David Hughes uh, to, to build out of this kind of a, a, a real code. Um, but so far, I don't think it, it has the you know, structure of a code. It is a nice code, but it has uh, a problem of decoding. Um, Oops, what happens here? What happens here? Yeah, so before I go to the stat statistical mechanics model, I want to emphasize one thing. What, so how do, what I said is that the kind of what this circuit generates is an ensemble of trajectories or an ensemble of quantum states. Each one you can think of it as a pure quantum state. And how do we characterize this ensemble? How do we characterize these states? So, the usual way we would want to characterize states in quantum mechanics usually is to um, do a, a look at an observable, basically average over this ensemble. But if we average over this ensemble, basically average over all the states, the expectation value of, um, of an observable O, it's the same as taking the trace in the averaged uh, density matrix. It's like discarding the measurement results. And in fact, if you do that, then uh, it's like a quantum channel where the Krauss map operator or the Lindblad operator or jump operator, if you want, they're the measurement operator. They're by definition in quantum mechanics, Hermitian operators. And if you have such a channel um, where the uh, Krauss operators or the quantum jump operators are Hermitian, we know it's, it has to be a unital channel. It has to give rise in steady state to the maximally mixed density matrix. So really nothing interesting can happen in steady state. In steady state, the system just goes to, to the trivial infinite temperature state. Yeah, so what, what I said is that if I look at observables, at simple observables, like I, can I use this? Mm -hmm. point I don't know where, okay. Um, if I look at the simple observables, there will be nothing interesting. What I really need to look at, at least, I, I really need to look at correlations between different trajectories or typical um, behavior of observables in a particular trajectory. And the way to uh, be able to do that is at least look at some moments of this operator. So I can look at the fluctuation of a particular uh, expectation value over uh, basically of the, over the ensemble of different measurement outcomes. Okay, so I need to average over the measurement outcomes, M are the possible measurement outcomes, the uh, square or the some power of an operator O, that will give me, uh, the, that can give me in principle the typical behavior in a particular trajectory. That's at least I need, I, I, I have to do. Um, an example of such a non, but in, in general, note that this is nonlinear in the density matrix. So it really doesn't know the fact that the density matrix is going to, the average density matrix is becoming uh, a trivial uh, uh, state. Uh, so an example of such an observable would be the purity, right? So the purity, basically, there will be no observable here. I just trace over the square of the density matrix. Uh, and in general, I can get all these moments if I, instead of looking like in Lindblad uh, at the evolution of the average density matrix, I look at the evolution of uh, n copies of the density matrix. So I'm going to, uh, and the statistical mechanics models are statistical mechanics models that describe this kind of um, n copies of the density matrix propagation. So for example, if I want to 
calculate the von Neumann entropy or actually any entropy, there is a certainty that in the end I need to take, I have to look at entropy of the density matrix propagating in time. At the end, I'll take, I need to take some replica limit, which means at the end of the calculation, I'm taking this number of copies n to one. So, so this is a certainty. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but for now, let's talk about replica by replica. If I look at two copies, three copies, four copies, and so on. What will really help the fact that the, to understand the statistical mechanics model that I'm going to get is to understand the symmetries of the time evolution. So there is an interesting intrinsic symmetry of the uh, power of, of the time evolution because this special time evolution preserves the purity of the state. So if I have a pure state and I want to calculate the time evolution of n copies of the pure state, I represent it as a density matrix. So it's a ket bra, ket bra, ket bra. And I want to time evolve it. And there is, again, I preserve the purity. So you see, by definition, I preserve the following thing that I can, I can promote the cats as I like, and it remains the same state, right? Just by, you, know, you can look at it and you see that it has the remaining same state. And in fact, I can also independently promote the bras. You cannot promote cat and bra uh, in a user way, but I can promote uh, bras and I can promote cats and it will stay the same state. This is a global symmetry. Uh, because I need, I, it's not enough to take one side and promote the cat indices of that side. I need to promote everything, the entire global state, right? So that's that's an important point. So it's a global symmetry, S n cross S n symmetry. There is also another Z two symmetry associated with actually switching cat and bra in the same copy, and that has to do with preserving hermeticity of the uh, uh, density matrix in in the dynamics. So, so this is a symmetry, okay? Um, it is important to understand that it's broken if we have decoherence processes, because what decoherence processes do is they create the mixed state here and the mixed state here and the mixed state here. What is the mixed state? It's a sum over M, over, so, oh, sorry, over some index I, um, psi I, psi I, it's basically entangling uh, this state with this state, the cat in the bra, it's like entangling cat, cat in bra, now I cannot transform cat and bra uh, or bra independently. I have to kind of transform them together. This is the usual classical replica symmetry where you transform the probability distribution. You have n copies of the probability distribution. You have this replica symmetry that you can switch, you know, remove between them. Here, you can remove independently cat and bra, and that's only if your dynamics preserves uh, the, the purity of the state. Okay, so, so this is an important, really important point, and you need to remember that decoherence processes break this symmetry. Okay, so now we are ready to um, kind of see how a uh, statistical mechanics model emerges. So, as a Simplest example, let's try to compute the purity of the state. So the purity is the trace of rho squared. So let's take the uh, time evolution of, you need, for this, you need the second moment. So you need two copies of the density matrix. So here is one copy and here is another copy. You evolve the cat with u. You evolve the bra with u star here. Uh, you evolve the cat with u and bra u star. So you see you have four copies of your circuit here propagating. And now what you need to do to get rho A, the reduced density matrix of A, is trace over the B subsystem, which is symbolically illustrated here. It's basically contracting these indices, but contracting these indices in this representation also means identifying, right? Because when you contract, you basically sum over the same thing, sum over in I, I, right? So, so identify the cat and bra from the same copy uh, at the top of, of the circuit. Uh, and, and now if I propagate that, now, now I'm left with rho of A, I need to multiply rho of A by rho of A. So this is matrix multiplication. This is another a different contraction for matrix multiplication and then the trace, right? So uh, the matrix multiplication, so now I, uh, you see that the difference between the A subsystem and B subsystem is how it's contracted at the top. 
and I can take the same circuit and just uh, write it in a nicer way. It's basically instead of looking at these four systems, I kind of slacking them on top of each other. And symbolically, you see in a subsystem, I identify indices of pet and bra from different copies, while in the B subsystem, I have to identify and contract your indices of cat and bra of the same copy. This is called identity, and I would call this swap, because I swap, it's like identifying cat and bra of the same copy, but I needed to swap the two copies before identifying like that. So, so this is a different contraction here and here. So, uh, this is nice. Now, what uh, I, I basically map this dynamics to not a static model yet, but just a tensor network that one needs to contract. Each one, each node here is a tensor, and now you need to contract the tensor network. The problem is contracting a tensor network is generally very hard. It's exponentially hard. It's as hard as calculating the dynamics. What makes it easier is that if now I average over the unitary gates, and the measurement positions and measurement outcomes, it, 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 it makes it easier. So if there are, remember each blue box like that is four unitary gates. When I average each one of them, they're all the same. They're, they have to be identical gates because it's identical circuits. And now I average over all of them. Averaging over all these gates makes the problem much simpler. You can see it actually intuitively why. So really, if you let, let's look at just the usual something you're not you, uh, more used to here, it's propagating forward in time, backward in time, forward in time, backward in time, because it's uh, four uh, copies of the uh, of the circuit. Usually you, you're used to just propagating a single state forward in time and then backward in time in order to calculate some expectation value that's simpler. And if you're doing, you're looking at an expectation value in some, for example, an electron in a random potential, right? And you're looking for some expectation value. You have a, a, the electron in a random potential. It's like a big unitary matrix. And now you, you need to, because of the expectation value, you now need to propagate backward in time. If it's a very big unitary, you know that in the end, uh, you will have many, many random faces that essentially cancel each other except for special trajectories that the forward in time trajectory, if you will calculate it using a path integral, uh, only the, the trajectories where the forward in time and backward in time retrace each other, they will have exactly, this, the phase will exactly cancel and they will add up, uh, it always, um, they will add up positively. So, so uh, and, and all the rest will actually cancel completely uh, after averaging. So, so uh, this is essentially what happens here. Here, um, so basically in, in the forward and backward, it gives you only one type of state, one where the forward and backward are the same. Here you have a very similar situation. You have forward, backward, forward, backward. So again, in order to cancel phases, you need the forward and backward to be the same, but you have some freedom. You need to, you can have that the forward and backward from the same copy are the same, or the forward and backward from different copies are the same. And these are two, basically the, this projects into two uh, states, uh, possible states in Hilbert space, the states that where I identify uh, the uh, cat and bra of the same copy and identify cat and bra of different copies uh, through each of these unitaries. It's a little bit more complicated because it turns out that it projects so into, there is, there is like two degrees of freedom per, um, per unitary, uh, which correspond to projecting onto, uh, this is in, input uh, qubit and output qubit. So there is one degree of freedom for the input and one for the output. And because what I said is only for a big unitary, for a big unitary, you can actually integrate it out and they become exactly the same. And, and morally speaking, this is what happens essentially, and you can integrate this out. And what you get is for every unitary gate here, you have one spin degree of freedom where spin pointing up, up means I chose the, I, to identify cat and bra of the same copy, or if I, the spin is pointing down, I chose to identify cat and bra of a different copy. This is identity and swap, just like the boundary conditions we had. Uh, but now in the bulk, there are degrees of freedom and contracting the tensor network is basically uh, summing over all the possible configurations and each configuration has its weight 
And, and so this is exactly like the partition function of an Ising, uh, of a classical Ising model. This is basically how you get uh, uh, um, uh, how you get a statistical mechanics model, and more generally for n replica, you get instead of Ising spins, you get generalized spins that their different states point to the different possible permutations of uh, n uh, of, of n objects, right? So, so you have uh, permutation state, and and then the, okay, I have I have it in the next slide. Uh, Let's hope that everything is yeah. So right. So let's let's stay with two first. Yeah. So so for for two copies, which is what I said. Uh, so now we just have the Ising spins, and um, what the boundary conditions at the top tell us is that they force spin up in the B sub uh, region and the sub the sub region A. You're forcing spin down boundary conditions, so you're forcing a domain wall to go through this. And the uh, contraction of the tensor network for the purity, and if you take the log, you get the entanglement entropy, basically gives you the change in free energy of this domain wall compared to having no domain wall in the system. So this is uh, what you get. And now if you have a ferromagnetic phase of the Ising model, we know that the domain wall costs the length of the domain wall, and that corresponds exactly to volume law entropy, entropy going like L. And if you're in the paramagnetic phase of the Ising model, you get that constant independent of L. Uh, this is the area law phase of the paramagnet, uh, or the, uh, the paramagnet corresponds to an area law phase. And as I said, more generally, we have N permutations and uh, SN permutations. And then the um, A sub lattice, which is basically has to multiply all of them, is a cyclic permutation. And the uh, B sub lattice, where I just trace out, it's the identity permutation. And uh, in the case of only unitary circuit, this is the shape of the most, uh, of the best domain wall. It just goes completely in 45 degree angle. This is uh, something that I forgot to mention it. It's, uh, it's something pointed out by um, Adam Nahum and Sagar Vijay. Uh, they mapped, they were the first to map this uh, truly just unitary circuit without measurements. And it turns out that they're very different. If it's purely unitary circuit, the domain walls are forced to go in 45 degree angles. And basically like Ising model at zero temperature where yeah, the domain walls just want to take the minimum energy configuration for them, the minimum length, and that's 45 degree angles. Um, uh, and then you get basically uh, exactly the volume uh, and no subleading corrections to the volume. Okay, uh, there is a, it. It turns out to be much diff very different when you uh, um, have measurements. When you have measurements, uh, then uh, um, the, now there are fluctuations because in order to minimize energy, you actually want to go through as many measurements as you can. And of course, the measurements disappeared in this replica picture, but if you take the replica limit, they basically have to come back in. It's like when you ever do a disorder, quench disorder, it's really you have to keep it in the back of your mind. And if you don't do the replica, the replica you can think about the measurements morally as being some disorder, and the domain walls want to sort of go to, through as many of the measurements. And, and it, 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 this turns out to be, um, in the universality class of uh, poly directed polymers in random media. Because uh, if, if you think of the domain walls as, as polymers, uh, these polymers want, these domain walls want to go through as many measurements as, as you can. Because every, every measurement is like a disconnected or almost dis disconnected link. Um, so, so a lot is, is known about these polymers. If you force a polymer to start here and here, it will not go down order L into the system. It will actually have a wandering exponent of two, two thirds. It will actually stay much closer to, to the uh, top. Uh, and its length will go like L plus some correction due to the wandering uh, uh, with a roughness exponent one third. Okay? And that means that the entropy, which maps to the, this free energy of the polymer maps to the entropy, will have a subleading correction to uh, L, which is 
uh, one third. That yeah. one third goes back to the original paper by Nathan Whitehead. He was looking at the entanglement density. Um, that is a little bit yeah. So so there were, this is different things because in in, in the Holmes paper yeah. there were no measurements. So where right. did the one third right. come from? And in in fact, his one yeah. So so that so it's an, actually a different one third, and it's a bit, also it's they're both random polymers. In their case, they were talking about an infinite system. So here I have a volume law because I have some finite region with size L. They were looking at infinite system and they were looking at how the uh, entropy grows in time in an infinite system in, or in, 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 in an infinite subsystem. Okay, and then there, then there is it's interesting because you see when I have a finite system, the domain wall has to go in forty-five degree angle. But when I have an infinite system, um, it has to go all the way, it has to go down. But it can't go down, it has to go in 45 degree angles. So it has many ways to choose how to go in 45 degree angle, and they're all degenerate in energy. Right. And then you get something like a random polymer, but it's it's a different, it's not for right. it's, a, it's actually a different situation. Yeah. So so yeah, so so for the entanglement growth. In time for an infinite subregion, you get this kind of KPZ or random polymer dynamics, but this is something you get for a finite region in with measurements, but not without measurements. Without measurements, it will just go 45 degree angle because now you see there is no fluctuations. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a thanks for the clarifying question because this is sort of a sometimes confusing point that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe five more minutes just to kind of enter. Okay. So, so what I wanted to do, maybe I'll do it really quickly, is um, what there is a surprising thing you can predict now, and that's something we haven't published yet, but um, uh, about to. Uh, uh, based on that, so take that theory and now ask what happens when we add some decoherence. And we now add the softest part of that kind of decoherence. Let's add decoherence only at the edge, maybe the two edges of the system. It doesn't matter if it's one edge or two edges. Let's think of two edges, also true. Uh, and, and the question is, yeah, so, so how does the entanglement entropy change? The problem is that the entanglement entropy now is not really a measure of quantum entanglement. The entanglement entropy uh, will still have a phase transition because we are changing only the uh, boundary, but it will be different. For example, it will not have this page thing that when I go to all the, even when I look at all the system, it will still be volume law because exactly of this boundary condition right. here, because if you want, decoherence is producing uh, entanglement with the bat, and I'll have a volume law entanglement with the bat. So, and, and this entanglement is not telling me about quantum correlations inside the system. In order to understand the quantum correlations inside the system in this mixed state and ask whether there is, there are um, uh, actually entanglement correlations inside the system, one has to look at a different measure. And a measure that is, um, people look at and we, we are looking at for this is called logarithmic negativity. For, because I don't have much time, forget about the exact um, definition of logarithmic negativity. What it does morally is count the number of uh, bell pairs that exist, more, if you kind of distill bell pairs between two parts of the system. If you have a three part type system, Let's call D the bat. It asks what, how many bell pairs are shared between the A1 and A2 subsystems of your system. That, that's, that's based morally what uh, the logarithmic negativity is counting. And, and there is uh, also a ready version of that that uh, is easy to calculate within a statistical mechanics model. Now, there is a very interesting uh, result regarding uh, negativity. Which is if we, if my bat is smaller than the entire system, then I for a so this result is for a random state in different states. If I take a random state of the entire system, basically the entire system is thermalized, and my bat is smaller than a one and a two, 
then uh, then the whole system, sorry, my bat is smaller than the half of the entire system, then the logarithmic negativity between A1 and A2 is volume. If on the other hand, B grows to be larger, even by one bit, than the entire system, then the logarithmic negativity between A1 and A2 drops to zero up to corrections of order one over the first bit dimension. So it's sort of, uh, and one way to think about it is when the bat is bigger than the system, no matter what, if this, if this whole thing is thermalized, it sucks all the quantumness out of the system. Uh, there are no bell pairs shared by, by the two subsystems. So one can ask whether the same is true if I put an infinite bat in not a thermalized system, but a system with bell that uh, I'm, I'm also measuring. Um, and in fact, I can put it very easily into uh, the stat mech model. I won't kind of go through it because I don't have time. But uh, there, it's just what it boils down to is just different boundary conditions at the top. So basically, the boundary conditions, instead of being um, the, the cyclic permutation and the eccentric permutation, it has to be a cyclic permutation in A1, anti cyclic permutation in A2, and identity in the back. Okay, so that's basic. And you, you can see very easily that it reproduces this um, for purely unitary circuits, which you expect them to go into a random state in Gifford space, you can actually use this 45 degree rule of uh, the uh, domain walls to find what are, is the best domain wall configuration. It's a very simple geometric exercise. I, and, and you find, so this is the negativity. If you take this, you have to, there is also a normalization, so minus this, and the ener entropy and free energy you get from here, which is basically the combined lengths, is is what you get and you get a volume law if the bat is small enough if the bat becomes larger uh well it's a, again simple exercise you see that the domain wall wants to be now too costly to have a domain wall like this you switch to some kind of pyramid of domain wall with another intermediate state which means that here between here and here there's actually two domain walls between in and you count the length and you see that it's exactly the same length as here and then you get you get zero so exactly this page theorem comes very nicely out of this statistical mechanics model, just as a sanity check. But now we want to ask now what happens if we have measurements? And if we have measurements, we do the same kind of analysis, but with the random polymers. And what you see is that the volume of part indeed cancels, but the um, non-trivial one-third correction is not canceled in this and what you so what you get is that the negativity uh in a, with it when you were coupled to an infinite depth in the volume of phase what you would call the volume of phase actually the negativity has this non-trivial large scale behavior but with a power l to the one third so the entanglement entropy real entanglement entropy in your system quantum entanglement entropy is not volume law in this phase. Once you put a little bit of decoherence at the side, when you couple to an infinite path, but really behaves like a subvolume law L to the one third. It's still so extensive. It's subextensive, but um, but large scale. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So that's nice. Uh, it's still there is still a lot of entanglement, uh, but less than and. and there is very nice intuition for how why measurements actually help you, although they disentangle. Why? Because without measurement, you completely lose all entanglement. Measurements disentangle you, but they actually help with entanglement. I can I can talk about it if you ask me at the end. So uh, I think basically, I, so th this is just to show you that we actually have a calculation. Sorry, where is it? So we calculated a, a Clifford circuit. Uh, this is the uh, width uh, decoherence at the edge and and look at this is a function of uh, P is the measurement rate uh, and this is the logarithmic negativity and for example take the measurement induced phase transition is around here somewhere and here I take an example of equal point one which is before the measurement induced transition what we would call the volume of phase and look at the negativity and it fits essentially perfectly to one third power. Uh, so, so that's um, kind of uh, interesting prediction. Uh, okay, so I didn't have time to talk about the last thing, if anyone interested to ask at the end. Um, 
maybe I could just say what it is finite time teleportation transition. You can ask um, if I have a two dimensional circuit now and I run it at even just unitary circuits, how long will it take to entangle two qubits that are infinitely far away from each other? So naturally, usually what you want would say is, well, it will take time of order the distance between them because the light cone will take this long to, um, to, to connect them. But what if in, I, I tell you that I, in order to measure the entanglement between say this qubit and this qubit after some time, I, I actually measure all the other qubits in order to project them into some well-defined state, except for the two qubits I'm interested in. And I ask you, how, what is the entanglement between them after having measured everything in between them? So how long will it take them to be entangled in this case? And now, now the time evolution here, there is no measurement. The measurements now are done only at the top of the system. And I only ask how long it will take to entangle, kind of say, this qubit with this qubit, or this qubit here, the entry qubit to the output qubit, which is basically like uh, how long will it take? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's faster than the distance. Right. It, it's now, yeah. So what it will be now, it turns out. So so it looks, it turns out that the entanglement entropy or mutual information between this state and this qubit and this qubit conditioned on the measurement outcomes for everything in between is basically the same as the spin-spin correlation function in this model with two dimensions plus one time dimension. So uh, and and if you Think about it, it. This model is sort of like a finite temperature, uh, where this time direction, this finite time direction, is like temperature, um, because the boundary conditions now don't that measurements respect the symmetry. So it's uh, and and therefore it has a phase transition as a function of the width, which is basically like a finite temperature transition. We can make it exact by mapping to a quantum model. Um, with at finite temperature. And it turns out that then you have a, fi a finite time at which you start to have entanglement that grows kind of continuously from that time onward between an infinitely two infinitely separated qubits. So this is a uh, finite time teleportation transition based on the same. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can, I can stop here. Uh, I won't. I'd like to talk about this in detail, but you can read it in this paper. Thank you.